sorry okay so that's we are starting one uh, student will give a short introduction then we will go ahead no problem no problem yeah i think we i've already been introduced so yeah we can keep it short no problem wanted to look for something um Are you there, ma'am? I'll begin. Yeah. Yes. Um, welcome back after that short break. I know everyone is eagerly waiting to listen to the second session. Without further ado, I hand over the platform to moderator Vritika, student of first year MSc Microbiology. Pritika, can you? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Hello. Hello. Yes, Dr. Tatu, you can just start. Hello. Okay, I'm not able to hear anything. Oh, uh, yes. Dr. Are we audible to you? Now I can hear. Yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. You, you, uh, ma'am says you may. Hear. Yeah, ma'am said you can start, sir. I can start. Yes, sir. Yes. Can I start now? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Start, yes, sir. Start, you can start now. Okay. 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 Thank you all. Thank you again for your kind patience. I think you, we've had um, exciting couple of days. Thanks to efforts made by by Dr. Jyoti, Dr. Betris. and uh, many many students uh, from uh, your college who have put together uh, all the you know this web based uh, platform for for uh, for bringing the talks in under this academy a workshop academy sponsored workshop uh, for the benefit of all the students um, i'm thankful to st joseph college administration uh, head of the department as well as all the faculty for making me part of this wonderful uh, academic activity that you have organized and uh, i look forward to many such interactions um i'm going to uh, you know try and uh, bring you uh, a conclusion concluding talk for this uh, um, exciting two days that you've had where you heard a lot of interesting science um, 
both academic science, clinical science, and I hope you had a chance to um, uh, interact with them, with, interact with the speakers online uh, to ask questions and so on. And as 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 your um, as the core, uh, Dr. Jyoti will uh, tell you that you can continue to interact with this faculty uh, subsequently. You are most welcome to ask them questions if you did not have a chance during the interactive meeting, but you are welcome to send them questions by email, uh, as I'm sure Dr. Jyoti will share their email addresses with you. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, I'm very, very accessible in terms of um, uh, my phone call as well as my email. So you're most welcome to um, uh, get in touch with me. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me to interact with uh, the students from St. Joseph over the years. I've had the, I've had a, I've been very lucky to have uh, some really nice, uh, uh, motivated young uh, budding scientists who have graduated out of St. Joseph College to who has who have worked with me. Some have now moved for moved on uh, for further studies abroad, and some um, are still with me. So um, I will continue to look at uh, opportunities to work with your college and uh, and. Uh, and uh, inspire, motivate, help, facilitate, support uh, the wonderful bunch of students that you have here. So what I'm going to do today, you know, um, is uh, again somewhat, somewhat interactive, really, in some ways. I instead of presenting you a bunch of slides uh, which talks about my research, um, I thought I will, uh, I will narrate to you a story, really. A story uh, of what has been going on in the last few months. Um, on the one hand, you, we are hearing a lot about COVID-19, and we are hearing a lot about how the efforts made by various bodies, government bodies, scientific bodies, uh, uh, state government, uh, scientists uh, in India and abroad. What I have, uh, what I have done is to try and provide the first hand. Um, first-hand experience that I want to share with you guys about uh, what have I been up to in the last few months and that might actually be of interest because instead of just reading about random uh, things that we hear about in COVID-19 area in newspapers and on WhatsApps and Facebook and all of that we are I think brainwashed with this word and oftentimes we feel that oh I don't want to hear this anymore but um, as a result I've tried to make this more like a story uh, as to how things develop and um, and and that might give you an idea of 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 what goes on behind the scene when 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 scientists and clinicians are trying to do what they're trying to do uh, to uh, help the community so um, on the one hand I will bring to you uh, academic industrial and community service efforts that I have made in in uh, broadly neglected diseases, which was the title that I had in my opening talk. But also now I will focus predominantly on COVID-19 and bring to you on the one hand a sort of chronological events that followed, but also insert inside of which some uh, developments, scientific developments that we were part of as well as uh, others have done. Uh, as again, as again, I would, I would encourage uh, students to interrupt me if there are any any for any questions at any point of time, even during the talk, but also after the after the talk, I'll certainly leave some time for students to uh, pose questions as we did in the last uh, in my last uh, talk. So this is what uh, I, I mean, in some ways, I'm going to uh, talk really about my twist with COVID-19 and this it started really in the month of January of 2020. 2020 has been very challenging for all of us. Uh, but things unfolded in a way that I was in the midst of all of uh, what was going on in COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. And, and as a scientist, I felt it's my duty to do what I could, what I can. And that's what I'm going to talk about. I did mention to you in my previous, uh, previous presentation uh, that uh, our laboratory is uh, focusing on infectious diseases neglected infectious disease, whole lot of them. It's really not limited to a disease or the other, but really uh, the whole plethora of challenges faced by, by, by us um, 
uh, all over, uh, you know, in, in terms of infectious in organ uh, diseases. So really, we are not limited by that I am an ex I have an expertise in this and that, but really, what is the problem in the community? And that's what we address. As a result, our um, research area is highly dynamic. We keep adding uh, research projects every year. And then this year onwards, um, because of COVID-19, I think we've now added this as a whole new research area, but also we've made some significant impact there. Now, one thing I want to say here is that um, the way scientists and industries and pharma industries um, rose to the occasion, you know, with, with COVID-19 pandemic is uh, exemplary. Government supported them all. And many people looked at, looked at it as an opportunity that, hey, the, here's a problem that we can address. Um, many people, of course, had not even heard of uh, COVID and coronaviruses uh, until January and February when uh, in January, of course, things started back in China and Wuhan. But um, at that point, it was all new to us, most people. Um, but people thought that this is an opportunity, I think, in some ways, an opportunity to con contribute to the uh, to the community. But also there was a financial opportunity for many industries to create products, sell, uh, because there were heavy demand of various things, right, from uh, gloves, masks to PPEs and then technical products such as the diagnostic kits, medicines, drugs, and now, of course, vaccine. So uh, lots of companies jumped into this. They really fast forwarded the research into COVID-19 um, interventions. We were in a somewhat different situation. Uh, and this is something I'd like to say that even before COVID-19 um, uh, became a problem, my research group was already focusing on coronavirus infections, which COVID-19 is one. Coronavirus infections are very common infections, uh, even in humans, but particularly in animals, uh, including cats and dogs. So if you have pets at home, it's very, very possible that they've had a coronavirus infection at one point or the other, except that coronavirus infections in animals are not always uh, fatal. They, they don't result in uh, mortality, but oftentimes they can be uh, mild and there could be various different symptoms, including uh, gastrointestinal, gastro gastrointestinal symptoms and, and variety of other uh, mild symptoms. Uh, there can also be respiratory, but the, the the way the disease manifests in animals is somewhat different uh, before COVID-19 took place. So really, we were already looking at coronavirus infections in cats and dogs. And in fact, we had an RT-PCR based diagnostic test that we were offering to um, uh, veter veterinary doctors all over the country. So we were doing lots of what is shown in the slide, feline infectious peritonitis test. This is the outcome of a coronavirus infection in cats. It's called feline infectious peritonitis. It's one of the worst in, uh, outcomes of coronavirus infections in cats and can be uh, fatal in some time, sometimes. Sometimes, uh, not always, but sometimes. And in this coronavirus infection, then there is a accumulation of uh, fluid in the peritoneum and there is an exudate and that as a result, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the diagnosis is usually done by examining this secretion, this uh, exudate from the cat that is taken by a veterinary doctor. And then the samples are sent to the labs such as ours who do research on this. And we had a ready test for uh, this kind of uh, infection. It was very popular in what we were doing. And that's when around and, and this has been going on for several years. Uh, but then in January, we heard about coronavirus infection in China uh, and COVID-19. And then suddenly uh, people became aware of it. And that's really what I, where I'm going to start that what have we done? So really, this is what I'm trying to um, get here that our lab has been doing RT-PCR based diagnosis of corona infection since uh, 2015, even before COVID-19. And as a result, there was we were ideally placed to uh, make a contribution. So you can really imagine um, what uh, what uh, the situation that I was in. On the one hand, I knew so much about coronavirus infections, uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, we uh, it, it was we didn't know where to start, where to begin, where do we help, uh, how do we help? Because uh, what we were looking at is uh, coronavirus infections and 
uh, tests in animals. And now suddenly there is, uh, we had never expected actually, and nobody had ever expected that this can become an infection in humans and can become such a widespread infection in that. So I want you to place yourself in January of 2020, 2020, when I was really surrounded by lots of requests for COVID, uh, coronavirus testing in animals. And suddenly I hear the news that there is outbreak of coronavirus infection in, in, animal, uh, in humans and that the virus has jumped from bats to, 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 to humans. Uh, I, we really had to reorganize ourselves. You know, the first worry that we had is that, could it be that this is the same coronavirus? And so we, we sort of set down on a, lots of activities in the lab in terms of understanding the, uh, the COVID-19 that was infecting humans, how close is it to the infection that happens in cats and dogs, understanding if the kit, the test that we already had running, would it work for this COVID-19 or readapting this test for humans and then trying to see if the government of India can take help from us in any possible way because of the vast experience we've had in this. Probably we were the only ones who were actually testing, uh, doing RT-PCR tests for COVID, uh, coronavirus before COVID-19 uh, took place. The slide shows to you the typical sort of, um, you know, the test that's uh, now done in humans, where in nasopharyngeal swab, you have RNA extraction, and then you do make cDNA, and then finally, uh, basically it's an RT-PCR test that allows you then to look at uh, whether the sample is positive or negative, where we look at a particular viral gene by amplifying it and try during as the PCR happens, you begin to see the increase in number of copies of uh, a particular gene of virus as it gets multiplied many, many, many times. That's really the test that we were already doing for coronavirus infections in animals and we had to now adapt to what was going on in humans. Now, this slide is, of course, a bit repetitive because by now all of you know what coronavirus is all about, but just for uh, to bring to you that coronavirus is in fact a virus that has you know a crown-like appearance and that's why it's called corona. Um, it, it has spike glycoprotein on the surface of it and then inside of the capsid, uh, it's, it's uh, RNA genome, um, it, and which is, uh, uh, which is uh, nicely packaged together with several other proteins, in, in, including um, including the you know proteins such as uh, the nucleocapsid protein and uh, many other other uh, proteins altogether the genome as I'll come to is about 30 kilobases approximately 30 kilobase genome uh, it's an RNA genome and it it has uh, about 15 to 20 uh, uh, proteins that are coded in the genome some of it we understand but others we don't understand the function of there are only predicted functions available for some of them. Uh, whereas um, we have um, we have uh, some information about the previous coronaviruses. So the coronavirus infections that have existed before COVID-19 are somewhat, there's a small difference because COVID-19 has acquired some additional genes and some mutations. And that's something that's actually a research area that not many people are focusing on. Uh, people are so busy uh, just handling the disease, uh, that's just managing the testing and uh, development of tests and then thinking about drugs and vaccines that uh, even scientists have not had enough opportunity to uh, dive deep into the research on 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 this new uh, virus and i'm going to share with you some aspects of what we did including the genome sequencing that we carried out to understand how close is this virus to the previously existing coronaviruses and also a lot of other omics studies, including proteomics, that we did to understand how the virus functions in the infected host cell. All of this culminated into us understanding the virus at a, in depth and so that we could develop uh, one of the best tests available for uh, diagnosis of COVID-19. This slide actually shows you the relationship between animal coronaviruses, which I have been talking about, with COVID-19. And I will not make it too technical for you, but just to tell you here that the closest um, COVID-19 is closest to the SARS virus, which uh, outbreaks that we have ha had in the recent past, and um, the and this the virus that has been existing. So it's closest in sequence to um, uh, to the 
to the bat form of the virus, the virus that exists in bat, and that's where it has emerged from. But also, as you can see, Wuhan, uh, you know, that's the virus that we are talking about. But pangolins have viruses uh, infecting co or coronaviruses that infect COVID-19 virus and the viruses in um, in um, in animals that have existed before. And so that leaves us with the possibility that could it be that we are going to see infection spreading to animals? Now, there's been a lot of uh, talk about it. Um, as you all are aware, there is, uh, you know, there were lots of news about uh, uh, you know screening that has happened in the United States. And there were two cases from Bronx Zoo where they detected COVID-19 in, in animals, but also in cat, other smaller pets, cats, and so on. Uh, there are reports from Europe that uh, uh, that a certain other animals, um, uh, minks, have uh, have acquired this infection from humans. Um, and in fact, this virus is going back and forth, COVID-19, from humans to minks and from minks to humans. So there's really a lot of information now that makes us suspicious that are we actually sitting on a time bomb? Is it possible that the infection may, may the COVID-19 may actually spread to animals? But I hope that doesn't happen. But currently for us, I, it's, uh, it's, uh, it suffices to say that the currently existing feline coronavirus is actually distinct uh, those differences that exist uh, are significant enough for the coronavirus infection in feline not to infect humans at least for the time being unless the virus mutates significantly and uh, there is no currently there is no um, uh, there is no evidence of uh, uh, of covid-19 going into animals, at least in India. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, this is something that uh, it's worth, worth talking about because uh, in a country like India with uh, 1.3 billion people, over 1.2 billion, uh, we are already having such a difficult time in testing uh, just humans. We barely reached uh, minimum numbers that need to be tested. So how are we even going to address the problem of spreading animals? Luckily for us, so far, this doesn't seem to be an uh, imminent problem, but this is something that we need to think about. As I've been highlighting from the very first presentation, that we need to be aware about what infections occur in animals. And this is something that we need to continue to be worried about. That could it be that COVID-19 uh, may also be present in, in, uh, in animals in India? And is it possible that that will serve as a reservoir in the past? And this is really what I summarize as a One Health initiative that's out of my lab, as well as all over the world. People are thinking about curtailing, um, preventing new occurrence of infections from animals to humans by addressing problems in animals uh, more efficiently. So here we go. I, as I told you, it is not. I, instead of showing you a bunch of slides uh, downloaded from the internet about coronaviruses, what I thought was I will give you a chronological summary of what I what what we've been up to, um, and what's uh, aligned uh, that with what's going on. And so, what I made is a timeline of events, and and since the end of two thousand nineteen. In fact, that's when we first heard about pneumonia-like symptoms uh, reported in Wuhan. Uh, I heard about it in December. And, um, and then in, it was around the first week of January when uh, Chinese authorities uh, I, you know, determined that this pneumonia-like symptoms were because of uh, a coronavirus infection. And they called it a novel coronavirus infection. And they sequenced this virus. And that's why the name COVID-19 came because it started in 2019, that stands for 19 to COVID-19, and because it's closely related to the previously known coronaviruses, and the sequence was closest to uh, the virus from uh, SARS coronavirus, which had infected humans in the past, and also the one that actually had transmitted from bat. And so the conclusion was really that the bats have transmitted this infection. And many of you know that Wuhan is uh, the, the vet market in Wuhan is infamous for uh, uh, for uh, sale of uh, animals and uh, variety of creatures. Uh, the conditions are not optimal. And so everyone blamed it on this wet market where 
uh, in, in including bats are sold they're consumed by humans and uh, and there was there was a lot of uh, uh, political uh, problem that arose out there the wet market was closed for some time but unfortunately now the wet market is operating again um, as we as we as i hear so but important thing to realize is that the activities that were going on the human activities of de interacting with animals in whatever form were responsible for spread of the virus from those animals in this case from bats to humans uh, what i'm showing you is the timeline in december 2019 7 january 2020 and then incidentally the same month uh, even before all of this happened we had actually planned a global health conference at uh, in my laboratory and um, in fact the authorities the global health experts from many countries were expected to visit my laboratory uh, which was planned even before COVID-19 happened. So, and that continued. So, it was in January 28th that we had a conference. And this is when you can imagine January when things were just beginning to appear. There were still not, there were still no reports about COVID-19 in India. There were no testing happening in India. At that time, we were sitting together as a team, together with uh, experts from Global Health Program uh, in Europe, uh, understanding and looking at the news arriving from China and other parts of the world. And this time, at that time, it was predominantly in China. And we were closely monitoring about cases that were happening. And it was only from January, February, and then March that we began to hear about cases in India. First death uh, around, uh, you know, the second week of March. And, uh, and by then, only 84 cases were reported. And that's really when me, myself, and uh, and some global health experts decided that we need to do something about it. And what is it that we can do? And already the agenda of this conference included coronavirus infections in animals as one of the topics, not knowing that this will become uh, 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 a imminent problem in, in humans at that time. And so we, we began to scratch our heads and say that, how can we intervene? What can we do? Uh, luckily, there was no travel ban at, ban at that time. And so the authorities from Europe could come, uh, the, the global health experts from Europe were here, and then they could uh, travel back to their country after the conference. And we had lots of discussions and decided that let's embark on examining, creating better kits, creating better standards, awareness, and so on and so forth. And what happened since then is, uh, is uh, interesting, and I'm going to narrate to you very quickly, not in great details, but we immediately contacted government of Karnataka because we had easy access to them and also ICMR, uh, telling them that, look, we already have a test for COVID uh, in our lab because we've been testing for it. Would you like us to help uh, us? And they were all extremely e excited to hear about it. We right away got in touch with ICMR. We started testing at many laboratories in Bangalore. I, Because I was present in Bangalore, we facilitated transfer of technology and empowering many labs in Bangalore. And also we tried, uh, we uh, interact with GOK, the industry commissioner to make sure that industries uh, continue to function. And this is what uh, I'm giving you a date wise summary of how I ended up talking to the IIS officers in Vidhan Sauda and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, approval of COVID-19 testing labs, some of the early labs that happened already in March, that's when people were still beginning to figure out how do we now go about setting up testing labs all over the country. And I was instrumental in many of these initial uh, steps that government of India took place. So uh, that was one of the things that we, uh, we, do, we did. Yes, I think there was a question here, but I'll address that uh, la later on. Uh, I think as we move along and, and so that's really how this happened. And then um, we began to think about that how now that we, on the one hand, I was not directly involved in testing because I was busy with so much of research activities, but I facilitated many labs by providing them trained people, um, training new people. And as you know, one of the challenges that we all had was that they were they were they were not enough skilled people available in the large number of testing labs that initiated. And so the groundwork for many of this, we were able to actually help uh, uh, and we continue to provide 
training to people. We continue to empower many labs in in many different ways. Uh, in uh, you know, because most of the labs who have now become full fledged COVID testing lab have no idea about RT PCR uh, up until this uh, you know February March of 2019, and it's not something that you can overnight start you know uh, sort of learn and start begin to perform. So. Uh, this was a big challenge that we had, that we had to train people to the level that uh, they become functional in, um, and, and the testing, as you know, has to be accurate. And uh, it's not something like a, doing an RT-PCR or a PCR in a research laboratory uh, where you have a chance of repeating the test. If it doesn't work, you know, you know, thousands of samples arrive in labs and testing has to be done in a short time. So you had to have very highly trained individuals. Uh, who could deliver results. Those are the challenges that we actually uh, took head on and um, helped uh, at very various level. End of March, some testing started within IISC, but I was not directly, uh, I was uh, not directly involved because I, my job was really at a broader level. And then I think I'm going to show you that lockdown began somewhere in the end of March, as most of us know, and many labs were closed, but we began to function and uh, and uh, did and that's what I'm going to narrate to you. I, I said a lot of things, so I'm going to skip a few slides, but tell you that COVID-19 crisis, we, we had somehow, as if we already knew what was going to happen, we had we actually arranged a global health conference at IISC in my laboratory, and uh, many health experts, including a clinician from uh, University of Zurich, uh, was with us, and we discussed, I'm just showing you, in fact, uh, uh, some of the videos, um, some of the uh, pictures here where myself and many colleagues are sitting and it was like a more of a discussion meeting, not the large conference, but a focused group meeting where we were talking about these are clinicians, including Dr. Nitin Rao was part of this discussion, who's sitting here yesterday, he gave a wonderful talk and many other, in fact, this lady here is, uh, 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 you know, she's an expert on rabies virus. So we also discussed rabies at that time, Dr. Rita Mani from uh, Nimhans and then uh, many other uh, participants were here. But at one such meeting, uh, we had these discussions uh, on in the end of January, talking also about COVID-19. Uh, it was actually in uh, around this time that uh, the GOK health minister uh, wrote to ICMR, and I'm just going to just showing you expert ex excerpts of these interactions, the letter that the health minister sent to the ICMR uh, that uh, that our lab has been doing this work uh, at Indians of Science, Professor Tatu's lab, and then uh, ICMR should take help from us and government of Karnataka should start this work together with us. And such, uh, I think, farsight that uh, the, some of the officials in GOK had. And um, this was around the end of March that we sort of actually, the price of testing was one important issue, that the tests were very expensive. And we were the first actually to say that we will create low cost tests. And this was dated 25th January, an article appeared in Times of India where uh, I, I was quoted that the test should be, could cost around rupees 1000. And uh, a lot of people were very unhappy about it because the, the laboratories, private laboratories were making 4,500 rupees per test back then in, in, in March. And I was saying, at that time that uh, test should not cost more than 1000 rupees and I became very unpopular in the in the circles but government of Karnataka was very happy and they started working with me that can you make this really happen because there's no way uh, that uh, 4500 rupees test can be a, you know uh, uh, will work for common man in in, it, in, in, in our country even 1000 rupees is too much uh, so how do we bring the cost down and as I'm talking to you today and as I'm showing to you this clip of an article uh, that appeared in Times of India, I feel so gratified because I have actually achieved this. Today, in fact, the price of testing, as all of you know, has come down not to thousand, but close to thousand rupees. A lot of interventions we have done. And uh, now uh, we have ourselves developed a kit which is going to bring the cost even further down. And in fact, we have developed a kit which is of indigenous nature. And as a result, and that's one of the reasons why the value of the uh, the test will be low, lower. And uh, it's it's so it's as I'm talking to you, I'm myself beginning to think that what the frustrations that I went through way back in 
as I said, from January, February, March, it was so difficult actually to uh, function, first of all, as the laboratories were forced to close down. Uh, on the top of it, on top of it, getting researchers to the laboratory from their homes because everybody was worried. Uh, people were discouraging, uh, you know, anybody to come go out, uh, and 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 especially nobody was willing to work on COVID-19, and that's really what the big challenges were. I think now it all appears like a beautiful story, as if uh, we knew the success was going to happen. But actually, I had no hope that. We will actually make anything work because the circumstances were so complicated and so challenging. Um, uh, and I think for me, this has been a great experience. Being a scientist, this is what one actually hopes for. On one hand, uh, to do something that's useful for the community. And this was one occasion where the whole human um, race was facing a common challenge, not limited to a village or a community or a town or a city or a country, but all over the world, it was the same problem. And then we were placed ideally, at least to help people in our own country. And I'm going to show to show in the next few slides a little bit more experience that how uh, we were also very closely involved in helping industries in Karnataka. Uh, government of Karnataka and this uh, industry commissioner, in fact, uh, took help from us to uh, uh, make sure that industries continue to function despite the lockdown. And that's one of the things that we have not highlighted anywhere in newspapers, but even other states, such as in this case, I think uh, this was a mission director's uh, letter to me from Andhra, actually, that he wanted us to help uh, with testing to uh, take place efficiently in Andhra Pradesh and how we quickly moved to make that happen, not only in Karnataka, but um, um, also in neighboring state. And we were able to do that. We are also able to interact with uh, some of the, you know, uh, other IS officers. I'm just, uh, this is not, I'm not showing this art, uh, letters to glorify my contributions, but how I think everything fell in place in some way when you offer help and when you, are, when you have the right intention, everybody supports you. And this is, you know, Karnataka government set up a COVID consultative group headed by the chief minister. I was uh, I did not become a part of it directly because I said my job is more like a scientist and I think this is what we did that uh, they sent us very nice warm letters to us about how we were able to help them and this is already in April that I think our contributions were recognized in uh, helping GOK fight uh, infection these are various snapshots of the discussion meetings that we have had with various IS officers in in the in the in the in the state of Karnataka, and uh, and then of course the testing, uh, we set the standards for how testing should happen. We demonstrated how sampling should be done, and all of this I think we did together with uh, you know many of this. This is gentleman who's actually the secretary, uh, principal health secretary to government of Karnataka, and we were actually here in 19th March 2020 talking about this. And again, I think just something. Uh, interesting to look back and see that how uh, because all everything that, that that one does with GOK and with ICMR has to be highly official there has to be approved by various bodies and uh, this was a very interesting experience for me to actually work and uh, with GOK and in fact they were asking us that why don't we also uh, look at the surveillance and screening in sewage samples because it it's it's well known uh, and around that time it was beginning to appear that the virus is also present in excreta and this is another whole angle that we provided in uh, 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 at the state level to understand where are the hot spots if you examine the sewage uh, then we can understand where the where the where the main hot spots are i'm sorry i'm skipping through the slides but i mean i want to quickly come to some science uh, but what i've shown you in the last few slides is really the first hand interventions that i personally did and what a wonderful experience it was for me. Frustrating, yet very positive, because as I showed you, I knocked on all possible uh, doors of all the possible officials. Uh, I'm not sharing you the, the, the failures that I've had, because of course we were not successful all the time, but many people encouraged us. And, and of course, everybody wanted help and many were open to taking help and which is what I'm sharing with you over here. And, um, and it's interesting because we were uh, not only 
involved in research, but also in implementing some of the expertise that we had in community uh, uh, testing in on large scales. So we up the standards while the testing that was happening at that level was was really uh, at a very low level in fact and that was one complaint that everybody had that uh, uh, there's not enough testing happening and we ramped it up we ramped it up in such a way that despite the lockdown industries were allowed to function industries were locked down completely for a while but then when we said that we can help testing happen at a uh, in a very efficient manner GOK allowed that look we will allow 30 percent of the employees to function and then big industries with tens of thousands of employees were able to do some basic tasks and as you all of you as all of you know if industries collapse and which did happen there was heavy losses and it's going to take us decades to overcome this but many industries sustained to some extent because they were allowed to function and this is very important point that on the one hand this is a health problem on the one hand it was uh, uh, about human lives but on the other hand indirectly it affected the economies of many countries in, in including india and functioning of industries was essential and this was such a wonderful experience for a scientist to be able to actually not only help through research in um, in uh, direct uh, science applications in testing and so on but also in uh, making sure that the economy of the country sustains uh, i i can't say that i've done much but Yes, uh, it was an effort which did not go unnoticed. Um, so at this point, I want to begin to talk a little bit uh, at a broader level, um, because while you will find all the technical information very easily, uh, it's easy to download information from Google today about what is the virus and uh, what is do and how does it spread. But uh, how do we actually deal with this in real life scenario is what I'm trying to bring to you. So government policies, ICMR policies to allow testing, scientific institutions and common people. This is all politics of pandemic. And this was amazing for a scientist to learn that it's really science is only actually a small part of everything that happens in a pandemic situation like this. Actually, the most important thing is really not the science. Scientific institutions actually were all closed down. What was most important was the government policies that really actually decides how we're going to face this challenge and my respect for government policies um, really rose during this time. I realized that as I already shared with you, I was doing COVID testing or coronavirus testing even before COVID-19, but it was really the government policies that helped us empower testing labs, empower industries, empower ICMR with way that uh, what followed. Government was very open to um, implementing changes, I think, implementing ideas. And that was really very important. Uh, um, and I would have liked to talk a bit more about it. But the point that I want to get across uh, here is that it's really not the brilliance of a scientist that's necessary in a situation like this. It's, it's really the, uh, the motivation for the scientists to bring science to people, apply it where it's needed the most, and that can be empowered only by government policies. I realized how insignificant I was as a scientist until government empowered me. So government policies are very important. ICMR, which is the nodal body, I think we can all criticize them about many things, but I think it was not an easy job for them to do what they did. Now we see so many labs all over India doing testing, but they are all regulated by ICMR. It's not like any lab, anybody can start testing because they have a PCR machine, but they have to be approved by ICMR, which was essential as you can imagine, because unless the testing is accurate, this was going to, the problem was going to get out of control. Well, it still is getting out of control, but I think we must give some credit to uh, ICMR that they've done a wonderful job in, uh, in a country like ours where nothing is controlled. Unlike China, where you can control situation very well. 
in a country like ours with a democratic way of functioning, it's very difficult to tell anything to anybody. Even if you, even today, as we go outside uh, in, uh, in, in common areas in, in the city, people are moving around without masks. You cannot uh, control public in India. But in that background, I think government bodies have tried their best. I must, I must say that. And then scientific institutions like ours, I think uh, we did our bit uh, in, 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 and we are still continuing to do that. And as a scientist, I think I've shared some of what I have tried to do at personal level and common people. This is so important because in the end, if common people are aware, unless they are aware and unless they understand responsibilities that they need to uh, fulfill, um, nobody can actually, uh, we can never control a situation of this nature. So uh, yes, lots of, uh, lots of things that I can say about uh, how this uh, ha used should have should have happened, and it yes, it could have been better. But I think we have done what we could. Here comes uh, the actual contribution that we did. Uh, as I said, uh, we were already testing, but um, already in uh, for the, since 2015. But now there was a kit required. There was a kit required for testing of coronavirus in humans. Uh, that was. Um, that was state of the art, and this is what we created. Now, this kit is out there. It's approved by ICMR, and it was started by a spin off company from my laboratory at Indian Institute of Science. And this is one of the now, uh, this has become a benchmark. And uh, it's amazing. I feel so proud that my scientific force, my students and staff, and part of uh, my spin off company at the incubation center in IISC, and then again in CCAMP, where we also have a lab. Uh, rose to the occasion and despite all the limitations we had during the lockdown, we pulled it off and ICMR encouraged us and they have uh, now endorsed uh, the test that we have developed. Uh, it's wonderful when something that we do has international impact and this is this kit is going to have one. Well, um, again, my main purpose here is, is not to blow my own bugle. It's really not to, uh, but really try to bring uh, narrate to you and many of you science students um, what happens in a scientist's life. Scientists are not always hiding behind uh, the walls of scientific institutions and publishing papers and winning awards, but they are able to extend their science to community. And um, this is what every scientist desires and wants to do. And uh, in my case, I was lucky enough because of the kind support from uh, everybody, including my own uh, institution, uh, my colleagues, and then government of Karnataka and government of India, that I was able to do a small bit, uh, and every bit counts actually. And I'm mentioning this because as science students, you could do. Let's not forget that we are still in the middle of this pandemic. It's not getting get, going away anywhere. Uh, it's not that we are talking about this retrospectively. That okay, this was a problem. The problem is continuing, and so. In fact, my whole purpose of presenting this and the way I have designed my talk is to encourage science students that, look, you can make a difference. Today, the testing labs which are there around the country require your help. They require your help. Of course, our parents and our well-wishers, our families and relatives will tell us that, oh, don't do this, don't do that. But uh, I must say that we must try and do something. If you are a science student who has learned science, and especially in microbiology department, we must do uh, whatever we can. And many of many many of students are we trained in RT-PCR, and we deployed them in many labs around India, uh, even outside of uh, Karnataka. And they are actually the ones who are doing testing because that accuracy of testing is essential, and that's where I think um, science students are doing this. Uh, people who have just finished bachelor's, just finished master's. If you think about it, even the process of taking a swab, you know, you may have seen in newspapers that government was recruiting people and training people for swab. So imagine, it's very important, important for people to do it. It's mostly done by young students. And it, you don't need a full-fledged medical doctor to do this. You need us. Even a science student can do it. And there is enough uh, protective efforts, uh, safety measures that are given uh, and that can be taken by people to make sure that the disease doesn't transmit. If you if you think about it, 
in the news articles that we have read, we've always read about frontline health workers being at maximum risk. Those are the people who are like nurses and doctors who actually face COVID students, uh, COVID patients. But we've never heard about a testing laboratory personnel, uh, you know, that the disease has spread in a testing laboratory. That has never been the news. I want to highlight that. And so the safety measures being taken because of the ICMR standards are so good that we have not. So really, I don't want people to be scared that I don't want my son or daughter to go and uh, do testing. The safety measures will ensure. Now, anyway, even a common man who stays at home today can get COVID. There are so many asymptomatic and so many of those. And so there's no way to stay away from it. So really, I think don't be afraid to do your bit. Um, that's really what I'm going to do. Uh, that's the message I'm trying to say, give you. And there are opportunities. People need your help. So whenever you want to, wherever, whatever is possible for you, you must try it. Well, let me now move into a little bit of the practicalities. What happens when you take a nasopharyngeal swab? What you are actually collecting from a potential subject, somebody who may be exposed to COVID, and that's what we are trying to find out through the swab, is the viral RNA. If the viral particles are present, there will be few molecules of RNA there. And those are then, RNA is converted into DNA, by, into complementary DNA by reverse transcription. So there is reverse transcription enzyme that does this job. In the kit, that's one of the main components. And then the cDNA is amplified by a PCR reaction in a multiplate format. And that where you began, we get a scan or a plot like this. So every sample that has been tested today gives a report or a plot of this nature where uh, there are controls. So when there is no virus, there should be no signal at all. And when the sample contains uh, virus, so this is how the curve will look if somebody tests positive for COVID-19, when there's a positive increase in the number of ampli amplicons uh, as the PCR progresses. And it is really the PCR cycle number that decides that's often described as the CT value. That is, uh, you know, that when does it actually pick up? What is the minimum number of cycles of PCR required uh, to uh, make the RNA, uh, I mean, to make the DNA, the, the cDNA detectable? And that's described as CT value. And that actually is an indicator of the viral load. But the way um, uh, the samples are collected, the way samples are stored will have some bearing on it. And that's why ICMR is not supporting uh, that CT values will be taken as an indication of viral load. That's not supported by ICMR. And for uh, rightly enough, I think because uh, we don't know what has gone on between the time from the sample time the sample was collected to actually the PCR assay being done. If the sample was not preserved correctly or if the sample was not taken correctly, you may actually have limited amount of starting material or some of the material may have degraded. And as a result, the CT value is not directly proportional to the viral load because of this unknown steps in between about what's going on from the time the sample was collected. This is just some technical information. And I think all of us hear about positives and negatives, but this is what it boils down to. Every sample that's being tested gives us, this is a highly simplified view, but there are multiple actually signals that you get because you have a positive control and you have multiple genes of the virus that are being scanned for. So each one of them should give this way uh, at least two uh, different genes one looks for, and then there are negative controls which should remain flat. Uh, and in light of that, that, the result is interpreted to mean whether the person is positive or negative for COVID-19. I'm going to just spend a few more minutes uh, because I'm going to run out of time and I want to leave enough uh, uh, time for questioning that at the backdrop of all of this testing and kit development, there's a lot of research that's required to understand the disease biology of the virus. And that's where the multi-omics approach and that this is the theme of the conference theme of the workshop and I'm going to end with that. So I'm going to show you some data that we have not yet published, but this is now submitted for publication. So it's, uh, I, I hope that you are not recording it because this is still not public information and just showing you the genome sequence of the virus. It has about 30,000 base pairs and then some of the samples obtained from patients, how we have done the whole genome sequence 
and the whole genome codes for a variety of proteins and some of them are listed here spike protein nucleocapsid protein and so on and so forth the polyplase gene product helicase and so on and so forth but at the nucleotide level we were able to identify shown in this colored bars are uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms the mutations that the virus has undergone uh, in the last few months so this is actually samples taken from patients in bangalore city from some labs and they were subjected to whole genome sequencing we have the every nucleotide level sequence information for these viruses and multiple viruses were sequenced multiple samples were sequenced from multiple patients and we have understood that this virus has undergone large number of mutations based on the sequence and based on these mutations we are able to determine where did this particular form of clade of virus originate from and that has given us some wonderful insight about the way the virus has spread and that's really the science behind it um, in terms of what it does and these mutations at the nucleotide level they also some of them make a difference in the level at which the amino acid substitutions will happen and thereby the way the protein will function change its function maybe making it more virulent more transmissible that's something that we are yet to examine because um, but we have predictions about how these mutations will affect so really uh, this virus uh, this whole genome sequence based information that we have actually helped us to understand where the virus has arisen from some other isolates in bangalore in fact were close eventually we traced them back to europe actually in fact there are multiple origins as you know all of these countries sequences genome sequences are now available and we are now looking comparing them and trying to see what is it closest to and i i will not have uh, enough time to dive deep into it to give you further information but it's possible that through next generation sequencing uh, it's possible to arrive at what you may call the phylogenetic map as is shown here to determine a virus spread and understand where the virus is coming from and there were really interesting surprises while we did the nucleotide genome sequencing what this slide shows to you is proteomic identification of the viral proteins now you can imagine that as i go back to this slide here when you take a swab sample and you can detect the rna by rt pcr what that's telling you is only that there was a virus present now that could be in an asymptomatic patient and the virus could be lying there just a few molecules and the the host uh, the patient or the subject may even fight its immunity may fight against the virus and may or may not come down with the disease so just examining or identifying the the genome of the virus uh, it tells you something that the dna is present the virus is present but doesn't tell you that it's functional what we did therefore, therefore is to do the proteomics of it because unless the virus is proliferate and when the virus grows it will make proteins and so if you identify viral proteins that's more accurate way of saying that the virus is actually growing in the human body and then we can actually identify what are the proteins of all the gene products that the virus codes for which are the ones which i express so again i would emphasize that these are hot off the press this is uh, i mean it's still not in the press in fact it's still uh, this is data which has just come out of the lab we have not yet published it so uh, but i thought i should share this with you because this is done by uh, students some of them are students from your college in fact and i'm proud to say that because uh, they have some of the students who work in my lab or have done masters in your college uh, i don't know which department i don't remember anymore but uh, it makes that much more sense for me to actually bring this to you first uh, before it's available to the scientific community once the paper is published but as you will see the names of various proteins what are the proteins that we have identified so imagine from the swab sample using high resolution mass spectrometry as it's called we are able to detect peptide sequences corresponding to the viral proteins and these are numbers here indicate the swab samples this indicates 12 different samples that we have examined and in each case which were the peptides detected are shown in black um, squares here uh, so total number of peptides in some patients there were only two and in some patients there were as many as six peptides and those actually trace back to which protein they came from uh, because of the power of mass spectrometry 
So it was great that our laboratory had the tools necessary for multi-omics, omic approaches such as genome sequencing, I showed you, but also for mass spectrometry. And then now we are moving on to really looking at uh, the metabolic changes that happen in the human body through metabolomics, which I mentioned in my first introductory class. So global genomics, global proteomics, and global metabolomics is what we are now applying to further our understanding about COVID-19 disease biology, because there are very important you know, changes that happen. And I will talk about just one small part, which I think you will be able to appreciate, because that's the sort of big question today. Why are there so many asymptomatic? How do you know who is going to actually get the disease? As you probably already heard, many, many individuals test positive, but not everybody suffers from the disease. And that's the asymptomatic positives. Why is it that some people are able to fight off the virus and others uh, have the disease? Sometimes severe fiend symptoms, sometimes milder symptoms, sometimes it results in uh, mortality. What are the differences? Actually, it turns out it's the same virus, but it's the disease manifests at different levels. And that's because of the host immunity. So in our study, in fact, we also looked at how do the hosts how does the host response change? Can we get clues about what are the host immune system related proteins that get elevated as a result of virus infection? So in addition to looking at viral proteins in these patients, we also looked at the host immunity related proteins in the same patients. And it was fascinating because we could find large number of, so these are patients, uh, subject samples who tested negative, for COVID-19 RT-PCR test and those which tested positive. We found large amount of proteins which were uniquely present only in people who tested positive for PCR, for uh, COVID-19. And those that we were able to see which processes those proteins belong to and mapped the pathway that some of the immune regulatory pathways, and this is a bioinformatic mechanism to be able to narrow down to um, what are the pathways that these unique proteins which are uniquely expressed in positive patients uh, uh, result in. And the results were fascinating because we found that certain parts of the in innate immune system kick in um, in people who get who test positive for the PCR test. And I will not be able to share with you, but some of these results correlate very well with understanding whether or not a particular individual will have symptoms to what extent the disease will manifest and whether the person will be asymptomatic. If there is some correlation at scientific level that we have, uh, but it's it's long, it will take a long before it, I think we can um, summarize this uh, in the form of very generalizable findings. The point that I will end with as far as this part of the talk and, uh, and I'm really am coming to the end of my talk is um, the fact that uh, we are now uh, part of a consortium uh, ICMR supported consortium. There are various scientists all over the country who are now uh, who developed a common consortium where we are trying to address this problem about host immune responses in COVID-19 to understand uh, why is it that uh, uh, some people don't have disease, don't manifest the disease and others do. And if you understand that, that's going to be very helpful in us developing better drugs and better strategies to manage the disease. Um, I'm really coming to an end of my talk and I just want to leave with some thoughts. I think this pandemic has been a very interesting learning experience, not only for scientists, but in general for humankind, mankind, humanity, uh, human race altogether. For the first time, I think, if I may say so, uh, we have realized, you know, things that we already read in science fiction, you know, books like Hot Zone and Ebola and this, of course, these are all based on reality. But luckily in India, we've never had any major outbreak that caused large numbers of mortalities that have been off and on. And we've continued to see diseases like malaria and TB and uh, HIV now and then many other infections that continue to challenge uh, our country and there are 
fatality is continually happening from something as simple as diarrhea. Uh, we have unfortunately a very high rate of uh, child uh, mortality under the age of five because of something as simple as diarrhea. So we are still coming to terms with some basic problems. And in the midst of all of that now, this COVID-19. So really, I think we have a whole new appreciation for why, uh, we, how we need to tackle infectious diseases. And particularly, suddenly now there is reality, something that had never struck us. Everything around us we take for granted, but today we have to face this fact. Is it, is it not possible that we can, the human race may get wiped out because of an infection? Today, I think this thought crosses everybody's mind. That it's not unthinkable that a new virus may emerge in future, which we may not be able to deal with. We are still learning to deal with this pandemic, which is, I think the mortality rate is not that high, particularly in, in India, uh, that people feel believe it's around 3%. In many other countries, it's higher. But now the disease is, it looks like we may be able to manage it. But in future, this is a distinct possibility that microorganisms can challenge the existence, challenge human existence. This is a possibility that we have to face. And then we have to make efforts that how not allow that to happen. And that's really uh, at scientific level, that's something that we need to, uh, and as microbiology students, what an important field you are in, in fact. This is all about microbiology. It's all about infectious diseases that we are dealing with. Uh, there's so much that I can talk about in, on this topic, but I will uh, respect the limitation of time that we have and move on to the very last point of uh, how do we do this? What's in store for the human race in future? Uh, and uh, I, I talked about that a little bit uh, over there, but I think clearly there will be tremendous efforts by WHO and uh, all over the world, scientific bodies in every country to, uh, to uh, brace ourselves, to try and be better prepared. The respect for science by common man has increased. It's amazing to see that even common man today, uh, common people uh, who even uneducated people have heard of things like PCR. Even, uh, you know, you go to a vegetable shop and he'll say that, sir, we to PCR. Karwaya. It's amazing that uh, how scientific terms are going around. Something that even my, even, you know, close relatives had not heard of. We had to explain as a scientist or as a science student what we do and what we learn. Today, it's uh, become a commonplace terms, terminologies are tossed around. A lot of people, of course, claim to understand more than they think they can. They do lots of speculations around us. Uh, but of course, I think as microbiology students and as science students and as scientists and teachers, we have a tremendous role to play uh, in the new world that we uh, are in today. Uh, I'm going to just uh, say thank you at this point because I wanted to show a little bit more about the efforts. It's, as I said, it's not that the story is over. We are in the middle of all of this. And I'm, we are actually, as a scientific group, I shared with you some science that we have done, but also we are now developing uh, more tools. Uh, although one of our RT-PCR kits is now there, out there, ICMR approved, but we are now going on to developing better kits even for rapid testing, because that's really, there's no way that we can cover a large population in the country by uh, RT-PCR. There is a need for better tests and uh, the, the omics data that I shared with you is now helping us to develop. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll have this uh, test also out in the months to come or years to come. Hopefully not years, but hopefully months. So with that, I want to, I'm sorry, I'm not going to talk much about uh, uh, other tests that we are currently doing, rapid tests, but uh, I will thank uh, all of you for your kind patience in humoring me in uh, uh, listening to me patiently uh, altogether two and a half hours or three hours in including my talk yesterday. It's indeed been a pleasure for me and I wish this was face to face meeting and I would have enjoyed talking to students much more, talking to faculty much more 
I would have loved to, I would hopefully when all of this is over, I would love, love to come and interact with all of you uh, face to face. But meanwhile, stay tuned. Uh, if you are a science student in the microbiology department, if you're looking at opportunities, if your heart tells you that you want to do something, please do approach us and we'll try our best to help you uh, find opportunities. Thank you so very much again for uh, making me part of this wonderful two-day workshop organized by your college. I really do appreciate it. And I apologize if I have been um, slow in my responses um, and uh, and not very punctual in, uh, uh, in sending um, information. Uh, but I think I tried my best to put together a program together with Dr. Jyoti and other, other team uh, in getting you something that's not uh, that's not typical, uh, but I thought having clinicians talk to you would be very interesting. And I think that happened. People who actually do uh, surgeries, they talk to you about the science that they are excited about. The futuristic science of metagenome was touched upon by scientists, and uh, these are all people who are actually doing this research in addition to their clinical practice. Professor Dipankar Chatterjee has had, uh, you know, he has had, I'm sure he, his talk had a great impact on all of you. And uh, I'm so glad that this happened, uh, uh, although a bit late, but it, uh, we were able to pull this off. Thank you once again, and I'm happy to address questions uh, from all of you, for some of you. Whatever. Thank you so very much. Thank you, sir. We are truly honored to have you amongst us for two days. And we have surely got a different perspective of the role of scientists and we are truly inspired by your work, sir. So let's dive right into the Q&A session. Sure. The first question is by Dr. Beatrice. She asks, does your laboratory have biosafety 4? As you mentioned, you are working with coronaviruses from 2015. Are all like COVID-19? as now working with COVID-19 will require biosafety uh, level cabinet four. Right, right. Now I saw that question. And uh, now, so first of all, minor correction there. You don't need a biosafety level four for doing COVID related uh, testing. What is necessary and ICMR has recommended biosafety level two for so all the labs that exist around uh, the country in fact operated biosafety level two is permitted uh, and and some labs have chosen to take biosafety level three but none of them are bs biosafety level four is a very high containment facility uh, it's uh, something that we only have a few such facilities in the country and it requires several crores of rupees of investment it's un it's not possible uh, and it's not necessary so ICMR has very nicely um, recommended and implemented BSL-2, Biosafety Level 2, uh, which requires presence of uh, uh, biosafety hoods of a particular specification uh, and then requires containment areas, disposal possibilities of waste, uh, and then, uh, you know, samples, uh, the way the samples need to be handled and there are a lot of specifications uh, so those are the ones that are allowed so our laboratory had them already even before as i said we were working on coronavirus infection and that as uh, that is um, that is permitted to be operated at bslm2 and uh, we already had access to that uh, for many many years and that's what we've been doing so yes bsl4 is a very, very much more complicated facility where uh, so, and that's something that's not necessary for dealing with COVID-19. All right, thank you. The next question is by Dr. Said Vajid. It might, it might not be relevant to the topic you presented. I will be happy if you could throw some light on the status of COVID-19 vaccine to us with emphasis towards the variations that are being seen in the genome sequence of the virus. I think it's a anybody's guess, Dr. Vajid. I think it's a very pertinent question, and uh, I appreciated your questions also in my first presentation. And I again, it's a very very relevant question. But you know, uh, I would be uh, I would be wrong in trying to uh, guess anything. Uh, but I can share with you some information that I have about the vaccine. Yes, vaccines are going to come, and I don't think 
developing a vaccine for corona is a great it's 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 really in my view not a scientific challenge um but uh, it's going to be a practical challenge for various reasons um um you know we have vaccines for various viruses as you know uh, and many viruses we have already el we have eliminated even from india polio virus is an example uh, so it's possible and uh, to develop vaccines and there are many vi vaccines available for many other viral diseases and so also for covid we will have one now given that there are sequence variations this virus appears to have high mutation rate it undergoes mutations and changes its uh, sequences you know sequences i myself showed you from the data that we have from our own laboratory not all those changes will result in change in the shape of their and structure of the protein some will the question is uh, is our triggered immune system going to be able to recognize that um, and we don't know the answer to that question yet um i think that the vaccines are going to work uh, to a large extent um for the reason that um the spike glycoprotein which may often be the target and that's the one that's exposed on the surface of the virus towards which a lot of immune responses are launched by the host there will be a lot of antibodies produced and also this a cell mediated immunity gets kicked in and i think that it may be possible the vaccines may be uh may uh, be effective the vaccines which are in the pipeline now uh, in many parts of the world we're going to see some success stories let me uh, then give you another perspective of uh, where the challenge will be and this is something that we don't often talk about but this is the first time ever that the world is going to require vaccination of the whole world's population that's what's going to be different for the first time it's not that vaccine is required only in africa or only in india or only in south america entire population in the whole world will need to be vaccinated at one point or the other so in my view the big challenge actually is going to be production of enough vaccine um ampules enough amount of vaccine to cover so it's it's that we just don't have a facility anywhere in the world which can produce so much vaccine some of the best uh, the biggest man vaccine manufacturers luckily for us are from india as some of you know uh, india is uh, supplying vaccine it's a vaccine uh, supplier to the whole world many of the vaccines that uh, are given in africa actually come uh, from india in many i will not name those companies but yes those are their uh, luckily for us there are good production facilities and vaccine manufacturers in india so that's good news for us but even then i think even if all the vaccine manufacturers all over the world pool their resources even then we will not have enough vaccine to vaccinate uh, the population that needs to be vaccinated and i think it's only going to happen gradually uh, but clearly the awareness is there the intentions are there and government support is there the support from who so i think we are moving in the right direction i think that a uh, beginning of the next year we will have some uh, success stories and uh, good uh, possibility of vaccines available to us whether they reach where they are needed the most is a question mark because we need vaccines to reach you know villages uh, you know people who can't afford it people who can't even access healthcare that's where uh, that's going to be a challenge so i mean this is my general view really as i have grown as a scientist what i'm beginning to realize dr wajid is that it's really not just discoveries that's going to help but implementing those discoveries implementing science is really where the problem is actually is. to bring science to work at the community level is really where the challenge is but uh, yes i think so that's my uh, my my two pens on the vaccine bit thank you sir the next question is by ritika can you give us your view on how corona virus reinfection will have an effect on us will it be more drastic or milder 
again, anybody's guess, really. I think, you know, as we were not prepared for COVID-19 and we are not prepared for the future, but is there a way that we can begin to uh, uh, prepare ourselves for the next pandemic, if at all it's going to happen? And my my uh, answer is, uh, um, we are not prepared. We, we just not ready. Infectious diseases and neglected infectious diseases like the ones that we are talking about, you know, there are these words which are tossed around all the time, neglected infectious diseases. And, but I don't think people, scientific bodies have done enough for that. Uh, WHO has, of course, put emerging infection list and neglected infectious disease list, but I think we're just not prepared to deal with this. Definitely microbes are smarter than us and they are challenging us in ways that we are not ready for. So yes, my, I think, clear admission here, and I submit that we are not ready. And we can try, but we're just not ready. Um, I gave example of rabies for that reason, that rabies is another, it's a disease that's around us, right? We, I think it's happening. I mean, as in the middle of the pandemic uh, of COVID-19, there are people also dying of rabies uh, today. Uh, so, but how much are we doing? We're just not doing enough for such things, yes, you know, gastrodiarrheal infections, which is not doing enough for even common infections that we already know, leave alone infections that will emerge in years to come. Um, so yes, I hope, I hope uh, government policies will uh, put more emphasis on this aspect of emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. That's another word, re-emerging, because flu has re-emerged in new avatar. Corona has now re-emerged in a new way. That's something that we need to take uh, stock of. Thank you for that question. Thank you, sir. The next question is by Ipshita. How will, how will the vaccine even be effective if the virus keeps mutating? And uh, yeah, how long I think, will it be uh, effective? And how long will it be yeah. So yeah, the vaccine design actually tries actually to also factor in uh, that the fact that virus may mutate. And so, you know, we've had that experience a little bit with flu virus, right? I think flu also is uh, notorious for for its mutation. Uh, it undergoes changes. Uh, influenza virus is undergoes mutations and what is called as the antigenic drift and antigenic shift, which is in fact textbook information. And uh, there have been vaccines for flu, which are not always effective, but they are uh, in part effective. So we've had some luck with that. And this, um, uh, we are hoping that we've learned from that infection, uh, that, that experience. So in case of COVID, um, my personal feeling is that the vaccine actually may work. Uh, the the ant antigens of the virus will mutate, but not so drastically that the vaccine will not be effective. And I hope some of the future vaccines will incorporate multiple proteins, subunit vaccines will come forward with multiple proteins uh, as uh, to trigger our immunity. And that might actually be a um, um, way to actually take care of this problem that if one antigen mutates, you have immunity against other proteins, other antigens of the virus. But uh, we, we can never be too sure that vaccine is going to be 100% effective. And then we can never be prepared that the vaccine will continue to work for uh, future strains of the virus that may emerge. Uh, so we can never be sure about that. Thank you, sir. The next question is by Dr. Beatrice. Due to mutations, will it be a cocktail of the strains as a vaccine, as there are different strains due to mutation? A single vaccine may not be good for all. Yeah, that's again a very good point, Dr. Beatrice. I think. Um, I think I kind of addressed that problem in my previous answer that typically people make uh, incorporate multiple proteins, not necessarily multiple strains of the virus, but multiple proteins uh, which uh, uh, which will trigger responses to various antigens of the virus. As a result, if one mutates, hopefully the other one will work. But no, we cannot see the vaccines typically, uh, it depends on the kind of vaccine, but uh, um, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a good possibility that we, we may also have 
uh, there would be actually possibility to have multiple sequences targeted in a vaccine, multiple protein sequences. And that can be done. Uh, that's possible for us to do. But except that we can never predict what sequence changes are going to happen in the viruses that will, uh, uh, the mutations that will occur. So, but yeah, for now, it's a good point that you brought up that it may, would be good to have uh, to target multiple strains and thereby the chance of success is higher. Yes, I, I agree with you. Thank you, sir. The next question is by Ms. Sharmini. Do you think the microbiome of a person can influence one's susceptibility to corona? <clears throat> yeah, I think this is again a very good question. Um, now, microbiome um, is, uh, of course, now, <clears throat> uh, I think you may have to think about microbiome in a different way here. You'll have to think about, but yeah, it, let me just answer that in a first simple way. Another, yes, this is something that we must think about because this is where the science is moving, that we sort of exploit the microbiomes to fight diseases. Uh, now, if you think about microbiome here, We'll have to think about what microbiome, not the gut microbiome, but we would like to think about the throat microbiome. And that's something I'd like you to think about. You know, we don't know enough about uh, the microbiome of the throat well enough to be able to use it in respiratory infections of this nature. But that's a possibility because that's where the virus lodges itself first. So if there's some way to manipulate or empower the microbiome of the throat in such a way that it would not help, it will not allow the virus to establish uh, in the epithelial lining, then that might be a way. So yes, I think it's uh, it's absolutely, absolutely a pos potential possibility, good possibility for us to uh, hope for. Thank you, sir. The next question is by Sandhya. Has your lab been keeping track of the mutations occurring in the coronavirus since 2015? Has this virus always evolved so rapidly? We had sequenced uh, coronavirus from an uh, animal in the past, uh, but that, as I said, the sequence is more than 90% similar, but there are significant other differences. And now we've had the opportunity to compare sequences with the human. So, um, yeah, I think the most important thing would be to sequence, continue to sequence the current uh, clades that are emerging and um, and uh, compare. Now there are, you know, thousands of genome sequences that are available out there, out there in the published literature and they're available uh, in many resources. So that's uh, that's going to help us understand how the mutations are happening and uh, prepared. But yes, I think uh, in the past we have done uh, viral genome sequence from animals, and they are quite close. But um, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think. But they, this the current virus is closer to the one that had infected humans in in recent past, and also the virus from the bat. Not so much. Not uh, not any more closer to the ones from animals. Uh, the bat is the closest one. Thank you, sir. The next question is, what are your views on Ayurvedic-based treatment for COVID-19? Uh, yeah, I think I will pass that because I'm just not qualified enough to answer that question. Uh, so I will pass that because I really don't know much about uh, that arm of uh, medicine. I do, I do believe in it. Uh, Ayurveda does have, in the past, we've done some work on malaria together with the uh, with uh, you know what is now the Institute for Integrative Medicine and what was a foundation for uh, revitalization of local health traditions. We've had collaborations on developing Ayurvedic medicines against diseases like malaria. But uh, I just don't know enough about its effectiveness against COVID. We just don't have enough information. So apologize, can't answer that question. Sure, sir. The next question is by Ipshita Mukherjee. How can asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic patients be differentiated? Asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic. Pre-symptomatic. Yeah. So people are trying to do that. And I passingly mentioned that in my talk. That's one of the efforts that are 
ICMR supported consortium is trying to make to look at the host responses. You know, uh, so different categories of asymptomatic patients versus symptomatics and then severe versus mild. We're going to try and look at how uh, in these patients the host responses differ. Uh, that's something that we are beginning to do. Um, and uh, hopefully that will provide us some answers in terms of what is different in terms of the immune responses among these different categories of patients. Uh, so luckily we have access to a lot, a lot of sample samples and we're going to prepare cohorts from all over India in this consortium project that's just gotten, that's just started, uh, initiated. And thanks to the initiative of ICMR that they've um, put together a good team of scientists to address this problem. Um, for now, I think uh, uh, people were also suggesting that uh, they would be, uh, you know, the viral load can be estimated by uh, CT values that I had talked about earlier. But uh, that's, uh, if we can be sure that the viral, uh, the, the, the sample storage and sample handling was all very uniform, then CT values in principle will tell us a little bit about that could it be that the viral load is low in asymptomatic versus those which are symptomatic. Uh, that's a possibility, but we don't necessarily have that uh, uh, data. Thank you, sir. The next question is by Aisiri. So there are a few articles from some scientists in China claiming that the coronavirus is man-made. What is your take on this? Uh, I, I, I request you to repeat that. What was the, the yes, coronavirus sir. from China? There are a few articles from some scientists in China claiming that the coronavirus is man-made. What is your take on this? Yeah, I, 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 I think I'm quite convinced that the virus emerged from bats, from bats actually. Um, so I think there's a lot of controversies about this topic and uh, a lot of people have, there are lots of stories floating around, but I scientifically there's enough evidence that the viral genome sequence is very similar to the bat counterpart. So I think that it's, uh, and we've had so many examples of viruses emerging from animals that have infected humans. So, and this is one such, I, I think there's enough scientific evidence to say that. So I will, I will uh, probably subscribe to that theory and my own research suggests, supports that idea. So I'm, I'm okay with, I'm, I think I, I don't necessarily have to um, uh, come up with a possibility of uh, a virus. Something I don't miss, I don't think the virus is already smart enough to do that. Yeah. Thank you, sir. The last question for the day is by Sandhya. Antibody dependent enhancement was a challenge in developing vaccines against MERS COVID and SARS CoV initially. Isn't that a big challenge with respect to COVID 19 as well, since they are very closely related? Um, yeah, it's, yes, I do agree. I think it is, it is uh, certainly uh, going to be a challenge. Uh, it is a challenge. Uh, but again, I think the, you know, the vaccines don't necessarily only depend on antibody responses. They also will, um, in, you know, activate uh, innate immunity, the t I mean, the T-cell immunity, the cell-mediated immunity, sorry, that's uh, cell-mediated immunity. So I think uh, there'll be multiple arms of the immune system that will come into picture, I hope. So I don't think it's only going to be the antibody response. That, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for patiently answering the questions. It was a very enjoyable and informative session. Yeah, and I thank the participants thank also for their active involvement. I now Absolutely. hand over the stage to Kadida. Thank you, Ritika. And thank you again, Dr. Tatu, for that gripping session. Participants, kindly make a note. In order to receive your certificate, it is necessary to fill in the feedback forms from the link that will be provided soon in the chat box. Please bear in mind that the feedback forms will accept responses for an hour after it has been posted. So please click on the link when it is available and fill the forms as soon as possible. I now request Dr. Jyoti, Vice Principal of the Science Block, Assistant Professor, Department of Microbiology and Coordinator of the event to present the concluding remarks. Mm -hmm. 
it gives me immense pleasure to present you the concluding remarks of the two days Indian Academy of Sciences sponsored lecture workshop on omic studies, omic sciences in the times of COVID pandemic, organized by the Department of Microbiology, St. Joseph's College, Bengaluru on 9th and 10th of October, 2020. The inauguration of this virtual workshop began with the invocation song. The head of the department, Dr. Beatrice Sequeira, gave the welcome address, and our beloved principal, Father Dr. Victor Lobo, addressed the gathering. Under the able guidance of the program convener, Dr. Utpal E.S. Tatu, the entire event was well planned to cover various topics related to omics studies and microbiome research. We had eight lecture sessions delivered by six resource persons from Indian Institute of Science, Astor Hospital, Narayana Netralia Foundation, and MS Ramya College and Hospitals. Session one was delivered by Dr. Professor Utpal S. Tatu on developing a sensitive and accurate diagnostic for COVID-19. He started with the importance of the booming science, the big data, and the relatedness of that with the omic studies. He also said that it is important to predict the diseases uh, by genomes, but it is also very important that to go into the proteomic studies which will predict the state of the disease. He gave us the interconnected link between the genome sequencing, metabolomics, and metagenomics. And also, he studied or uh, he emphasized on their studies on the neg neglected uh, infectious diseases and how the pathogen is crossing across the barriers. Session two was delivered by Professor Dipanka Chatterjee. Honorary Professor, Molecular Biophysics Unit, IAC, Bangalore. He spoke about the antimicrobial resistance of bacteria and also about the use and abuse of antibiotics. He take us through some of the criteria for the vaccine production and also about the antimicrobials. From his own personal research experiences, he has shared the knowledge of the role of the allormones and the, it, it is its responses in modulating the differential stringent responses. And also he has made the connectivity of this omic studies and also with the microbial resistance. Dr. Ghosh from Narayana Netralia Foundation gave the third session on microbiome of the eye. He has taken us through the eye as an immune privileged organ. He also emphasized on the ocular barriers and what happens if the barriers are disturbed. He also has emphasized on some of the pathogenic microorganisms which causes the eye infection. He has introduced us to immune landscape and also the interoptome. He has emphasized on the resident and the visitor immune cells, which makes sure that the eye maintains the homeostasis. Session four was delivered by Dr. Nitin Rao. The topic of his choice was gut microbiome changes in diseases and interventions. He has taken all the informations from the published research articles and presented as, as a review, which has emphasized on the dysbiosis and also about some of the microbiome which are involved in the diseases right from a simple diarrhea and into the deepest Parkinson's disorder. He has also mentioned about the fecal transplant, which are helpful in restoring the gut microbiota of the patients. Session five was dealt by Dr. Sonal Astana, 
He spoke about the gut microbiome and liver function. He also has spoke about the dysbiosis and especially how the microbiome is getting altered after alcohol consumption, which leads to the leaky gut and the inflammatory responses. He also has uh, taken some of the cultural and non-cultural methods to diagnose the gut microbiota. And also he has concluded his talks by giving a focus which has to be shifted from the prognostic rather than the diagnostics by using the microbiome signatures. Session 6 was on probiotics in health and diseases which was delivered by Dr. Avinash, Associate Professor, Department of Surgical Gastroenterology, MS Ramya Medical College. He made the session very interactive by posting some of the questions and also some of the uh, studies what he has done uh, from his research expertise. He has mentioned about some of the technologies like the breathe test, narrowband imaging endoscopy and so on. And also he spoke about the hookworms and he showed his own personal uh, experiences, the slides he shared with us and also uh, told us how these hookworms can cause diseases and also how they can be used as the therapeutic, uh, therapeutic agents. The seventh session was delivered by Professor Dipanka, who spoke about the social behavior in bacteria. The main concern of his talk was about the quorum sensing happening between the microbiota and how the inter, uh, uh, interaction happens through the secreted molecules, the auto inducer and so on. And he said that how the correlation is happening between the biofilm formation and also the antibiotic resistance developed in the bacteria. So it is important to study the pathways so that we can exploit the possibilities of the bacterial colonization and then eventually the bacterial resistance. The concluding session was given by our convener, Dr. Utpal Tatu, who has spoken about his lifetime experiences, which is of the current pandemic coronavirus detection. He also has uh, told us how this RT-PCR based diagnostic was being carried out in his lab since 2015 on the neglected infectious diseases and now the interaction between the pet animals and the uh, other wild animals with the human, how the pathogen is being transferred into the human population and also scientifically proved by the sequence analysis. And most importantly that the benefit of the society from the science was also being mentioned how they have developed an, effect, uh, an efficient testing kit which was given in an afford affordable price to the public. And he also has highlighted the importance of the personas who are involved in the COVID testing should also be provided with the safety measures and the current concern which is being focused only on the frontline health workers should also be extended to the testing professionals. So all these sessions were highly interactive. As a coordinator of this lecture workshop, I take this opportunity to thank Indian Academy of Sciences for giving us this opportunity uh, of conducting this sponsored lecture workshop. I also thank Dr. Utpal Tatu for convening the session and also streamlining the entire session with uh, helping us to bring out the eminent uh, speakers from different fields. And also, we, uh, I thank all the people involved in this lecture workshop. We look forward to have more collaborations with IAS and the other resource persons. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, ma'am. Small seeds of gratitude will produce a harvest of hope. Whatever you appreciate and give thanks for will increase in your life. I request Ms. Ria Saha, Assistant Professor, Department of Microbiology, to deliver the word of thanks. Thank you, Aldrida. Good evening to one and all. 
Lao Tzu said, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Our journey for the Science Academy's lecture workshop began with one step for sure, but the journey culminating into these two days would not have been possible if we weren't accompanied, supported, and encouraged by innumerable people. As John F. Kennedy said, we must find time to stop and thank the people who make a difference in our lives. On that note, I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has been a part of this journey and I apologize in advance if I miss out someone. We immensely thank Father Rector, Father Principal, our Registrar and the Vice Principals of various sections for constitutively being our pillar of support and motivation in every endeavor we make. This workshop wouldn't have materialized without the acceptance, guidance and sponsorship of the Indian Academy of Sciences, Bengaluru. It is exceptional of the Academy to keep striving to let the fire of knowledge transcend the current barriers created due to the pandemic. We place on record the immense help we received from Mr. C.S. Ravi Kumar, Assistant Executive Secretary, the IAS. We remain obliged to Dr. Tatu for agreeing to be the convener and guiding us to the fruition of the workshop. This event would have been highly impossible if not for the resilient efforts of Dr. W. Jyoti, coordinator of the workshop. Ma'am has tirelessly toiled to string together the small steps we took and transform them into this successful journey. We are blessed to have a very supportive department and colleagues. We thank Dr. Beatrice, the HOD of our department, and all our colleagues for their constant support, motivation, and help throughout. Our hearts are filled with immense gratitude and appreciation for all our speakers, for accepting our invitation and for being so accommodating at all times. Words wouldn't be enough to thank you all. Our greatest treasures and strength of all times are our students. We wouldn't be what we are without them. If all of our students, present and past, hadn't supported us, this event wouldn't have come to life. They have been our teachers, our guides and support system throughout this journey. We would like to place on record the magnanimous efforts of them. Samson, Amal and Shankar for helping us find, understand and use this platform and also for helping the speakers with the same. Samson played a major role in handling the platform and all the troubleshooting that, related, that was needed. Amal and Shankar have made sure that the sessions were streamed without any hassles on YouTube. Three of them made sure that the platform worked without any technical trouble and supported us with everything that we required at every step. Jennifer for the poster, Larissa for the certificate and feedback form, and all three of them were made in a very, very short time. Caldrida for being a fabulous host. Tomia, Caldrida, Ching, Rencia, Jennifer for the melodious invocation. And Shruti, who was our undergraduate student, for editing the same. Our moderators, Madiha, Sumeru, Gauri, Vritika, for beautifully handling the sessions. Nishi, Tomia, Anusha, Priya, Amal, and Shankar for meticulously collating the participants' questions so that they could be posed to our speakers without any delay. An event is lively owing to its audience, and our participants have been extremely vibrant and interactive, giving all the talks an extra zest. Thank you for your dynamic involvement. Finally, we thank God Almighty for giving us this opportunity, the strength, and the means to witness what we all had envisioned materialize into this reality. Thank you everyone and have a very good evening and weekend ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Thus, we have come to the end of the events for day two, as well as the end of the two day lecture workshop on omic sciences in the times of COVID pandemic. It has indeed been a wonderful learning experience for all of us, and we are grateful to all the eminent resource persons for their interesting lectures.
Thank you for joining us and being a part of this lecture workshop. Thank you all. Have a pleasant evening. Yes.